his fantastic memory. I asked him when he was admitted to the bar, without hesitation, he said June 18, 1913. And I doubt that there are many of us in the room who could give the precise date that we are working or admitted to the bar. Uh, Judge Robinson, as I had it, was born uh, in Texas, in Erath County, in about 1875. I understand that uh, he and his family came to Indian Territory in the uh, late 1880s or early 1890s and settled somewhere around what is presently Tishomingo. Uh, I'm not certain of when the, the judge and his family came to Oklahoma Territory, but uh, uh, I understand it was a few years after they came to uh, this part of the country. Judge Robinson uh, graduated uh, in 1906 from the... Uh, Oklahoma Central State Teachers College at Edmond. Uh, he was, uh, I understand, the first superintendent, uh, county superintendent of schools for Pottawatomie County and actually was instrumental in, in organizing the school system in this county. Uh, I believe he served as uh, county superintendent from 1907 to 1913 and was serving when the uh, statehood was enacted. Uh, <clears throat> Judge Robinson is a was a former assistant county attorney at Tecumseh during World War I, I think 1915 through 1919. He, uh, he was the mayor of Tecumseh during the World War I period, or a part of it. He is a county judge serving from 1919 to 1923. Uh, he is a former city judge here in Shawnee and served in the late 1950s. He is a former uh, city attorney at Tecumseh. Uh, he served uh, as uh, president of the Tecumseh School Board and as a member of the school board for some 20 years at Tecumseh. He is past master of the Tecumseh Masonic Lodge, and he is a mason here in Lodge 523. Uh, Judge Robinson has for many years been an elder in the Presbyterian Church here in Shawnee, and for many, many years taught one of the adult Bible classes. Judge Robinson has uh, four children, uh, two of whom have been introduced to you. The other two, uh, Aggie Joe Mallard, is a resident of Washington, D.C., and uh, Lou Alice Hamlin, of course, is a resident here of Shawnee. Uh, Judge Robinson has uh, seven living grandchildren, and it is my pleasure now, and I ask you to welcome with me the Dean of the Pottawatomie County Bar Association, Judge Clarence Robinson. Old government road from old 
Shawneetown, the mission south of town here, up to Sack and Fox Agency. There you go, the government rules run along this hill here somewhere. It must have been within a hundred yards of where my house is now, and I sit there and look at the television of the night and think about it. Seventy-four years ago, when we drove through this country house, it wasn't wild. We weren't scared of anybody. There was no danger. There wasn't any outlaws to speak of. Peace of the country. You know, we never had a lock on our house in, in Texas, nor in the Indian Territory, or in this country. So after we got civilization, of course, then we got had to lock up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they assigned me this subject, Mr. Kenneth Happernett, he said I was to talk about lawyers. I got a card the other day, all nicely inscribed around here, and said I was to talk about the Bar Association. Well, I don't know too much about the Bar Association. I've been a member of it, I think, ever since it started, or practically so, and all. I wasn't here before. I was in the Bar in 1913. But uh, I became a member right away, and I've enjoyed my membership very much. But uh, this card said I was talking about the Bar Association. Well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to talk about lawyers. <laughs> you know, uh, Randall was born into a lawyer's family. His daddy was one of the finest lawyers in the country and one of the best judges that we had in the county of Cardinal. But I think after the practice of his court for a good many years, then I never saw a lawyer, didn't know what it was until I was 16 years old. Out in Texas, where I lived, it's a very healthful, fine country, law-abiding people. There's only about two diseases out there that are fatal. One of them is old age and the other is horse stealing. It was usually terminated to man's life with it early if you practiced that profession in that part of the country. But we left there when I was eight years old and we came to Indian Territory. Dad thought that there was going to be, his territory was going to be opened up to statehood and he wanted to get in on the ground floor. So we lived eight years in Indian Territory. And in 1892, just soon after the opening of Port of Wadham County, we moved up here. And we got a farm out of east of town here. And the first lawyers I saw was in 1894. We had a big picnic at the Pleasant Valley. And that was the year that the populace came down on the food. You know, they'd had a scourge of grasshoppers in Kansas and Nebraska. And those people had to get even with somebody, so they put their Republican Party in with populist. A lot of them moved down here. Well, these old Texans and Missourians and, uh, and Arkansas that lived here, they were good old solid Democrats. But a lot of them got infected with that book, and they went properly. Now, in 1889, the Republicans were in power, and they appointed a full set of officers for the state of Oklahoma. In 1891, on the 22nd day of uh, September, part of Wadham County was opened for settlement. And also, they sent in a bunch of Republicans for uh, uh, county officers. And I want to say that I knew several of them, and they were pretty fine fellows. They were well-educated, qualified, but they were Republicans, and that was a fatal disease politically in Potawatomi County about that time. So in 1892, we had our first election, and the Democrats carried the county from one end to the other, elected the full set. And they were pretty good fellows, too. They were Democrats, of course, but then about that time, the panic come on. Corn was worth nothing at factory, and cotton was worth five cents in the bale after the gin. So they had to blame somebody. They blamed the whole Cleveland, of course, and the country went populist. And it went populist with a big pop. They carried about a thousand and twenty-six majority, I mean, uh, votes for the populist ticket, and uh, about uh, six hundred and fifty for the Democrats, and uh, six hundred and twenty-five or something like that. I looked it up not long ago. I wouldn't remember that. And uh, for the Republicans, and they elected a pretty decent set of fellows. They were elected on the theory, you know, that they ran well, too much county officers and so forth. But I noticed afterwards when I got to thinking about it that most of those fellows were pretty well to do. You take Mr. Uh, Ruggles, Ruggles, who was elected county judge. He, uh, after his term of office was out, which just was two years after he got in, well, he started the bank. But he had the money before he come down here. He didn't make anything as much as county judge. And, uh, Mr. Mike Paul was quite an able lawyer. He was county attorney, I believe, at that time. And he was one of the wealthiest men in the county. Later, he turned Democrat and was elected, and then Ed Demetri got his go for the statehood. And I heard him say out in the hall, I could have won that if I'd have spent a thousand dollars, but didn't think it was worth it. Well, it wasn't worth it. It was only worth two hundred dollars a month at that time, two hundred and five, I think. So now today I'm going to talk about these lawyers that I knew. You know, instead of uh, Mr. 
the Burns support that he was not very popular with the elderly ladies of his community. He went into church one morning, and one of them passed by him and called him a louse, which he probably was, personally. He looked up, he saw a big, big specimen of a ridiculous curl into her hair, and he said, Madam, it's been often said that people talk most about that which runs in their head. So I'm going to talk about what runs in my head this time. At that picnic on the 4th of July, 1924, uh, the uh, candidates were all there. Mr. Sheldon was making a speech, a 4th of July speech. He looked at them, I like he must be about uh, 70, 75 years old. Fine old fellow, but his speech didn't interest me very much. He drove, drove along, slow, didn't get anywhere with it. But he tried to talk about the melting pot of the United States, how it assimilated the people from all other states, all other nations. And one thing he tried to do was to imitate how they would say who for the 4th of July. Well, he went along and mimicked the German and the English and the first one and the other, but he got out of the Chinaman. I didn't know at that time, time we had any Chinese citizens of the United States, and I didn't think we had very few of them more to celebrate anyway. But he said, who are all from the floor of July? And I got tired of him and quit. I saw a good-looking young woman. I thought needed to get you by my age, so I fit out. <laughs> and and uh, by the way, that was a disaster, too. I just had 25 cents, and I started to take her to get a drink, and she caught up with the other girls, and when I liquid that, that's become very fluid. It isn't there like this. <laughs> my own mind was running around. It is like that. But, uh, but, uh, I remember Sheldon, and I remember Ben Wakeney. Ben, for some reason, I don't know what, had on a linen duster, a little old brown with a linen duster that flopped in the wind. And he was busy as in the cranberry merchant, talking to voters. Nobody talked to me about voting. I was too young, and I wasn't big enough to think I was old enough. But I know it was Ben, and I never lost that picture. He always made me think of a big, big old grasshopper somehow. Or another. He was slim and had that old coat put around him. And I heard more of Ben later. He was one of the fellows that I admired, and I always kept, uh, kept in touch with him as long as he lived. That fall in 1914, and 1794, I'll give you right with I decided I'd better go to school. I'd got about to the eighth grade in the four years or so, and reading books and things in Indian territory, but I told Dad, we'd put in about 75 acres of timbered land, and I'd been one of his good hands. I'd cut an awful lot of timbers and build log houses and barns and rail fence two miles of it. Put in cultivation about 75 acres of land. I said, Dad, I've got to go to school if I'm ever going to. So I went to the country, and I went into the eighth grade. George McKinnis was my teacher. Not this George over here, you daddy, of course. And uh, I got quite a lot of questions with him. My friendship would last as long as he lived. I stayed with him till about the uh, first of January when they had a big rumpus in that Tecumseh school and they fired the city su the, uh, the superintendent of the school. His name was George W. Pack, a very fine man, a very well-educated man, one of the best teachers I ever saw. He started a, he started a little independent school over there in the big hall where the Colonel Furniture Company is now. That was the first brick house in town that I know of. He had a man by the name of David. And they were fine teachers. They had a little uh, business college, and all they just let you go as fast as you want to. So I went over there and did the janitor work and worked there. And in the front of that room, front of that building, there were two offices. One of them was uh, the office of Judge Milton, one of the first lawyers that I got acquainted with. He didn't get acquainted with me, but I got acquainted with him. And uh, the other one was Judge Feldman. They were two of the leading lawyers in the Pottawatomie County at that time. The first time I heard Pendleton, I was, or not Pendleton, but uh, Milton, I was uptown, and the old courthouse was in the middle of the uh, block. And I heard somebody making a speech. They were having a, after, they were having a night session, and a big murder case was in process. It was a case where a man by the name of Willis was charged with murdering some other man up here close to Eakin Dusty. And two questions were at issue in that to start with. One of them was the venue of the case, and the other was the jurisdiction of the court. Of course, the jurisdiction depended on the venue, and the question about that was whether the man was killed on this side or on the Seminole side of the county line. So I listened to that man's argument for a while, and I got my first lesson in law, that you had to have, uh, the thing had to be tried where the venue was, and the court wouldn't have any jurisdiction and wasn't any venue. So I learned my first lesson of law right there. Got a pretty good idea of what it was, at least. I was uh, interested in his speech. He was making a speech in an absolutely forlorn case. There wasn't any question about
about the man's gifts, as far as I could tell. I'd never heard of it, but I heard his speech. And the way he pled and the way he talked, first he tried to argue that the blood in the man's wagon was hog's blood. Then he said he was sick and had a headache and he just couldn't, could hardly walk, but he had to go on. And I knew then that he was losing that case, and sure enough he did. They brought in a verdict of, of guilty and sent him to hang. Of course, that was the day of the federal court. Oh, Judge Crimson, the first time I saw him in court, he was defending a fellow by the name of Ellis that killed a man down in uh, Old Burnett. He used to be called a town down there. The man had been tried, and the case had taken to the Oklahoma Supreme Court, the, the territorial court at that time. Most of you remember how the courts were organized. They first had three judges, and then five, and then seven in the Oklahoma Territory. And this was, I think it was three judges Supreme Court. But anyhow, the case was reversed and came back for a new trial. And he'd just been tried. And I happened to be in court that morning, on Saturday morning, I suppose. I don't know how else I'd have been there. And Judge Pendleton was a fine-looking man, tall, suave, dignified, polished, just a perfect gentleman. He was making a plea to the judge, Judge Scott. The judge I said looked like you. Uh, not. He was good-looking, tall, and handsome. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm not ready to get even with you, Judge. <laughs>
going to live most of the to start with here, I'm going to live to them. There was uh, Melvin, Blakeney, Foster. By the way, Foster was a big, tall, nice looking fellow. He wore a cutaway coat all the time. He didn't stay in the practice very long. He organized the county Democrats and was head for the county Democrats for a while. Kevin, Charlie Bright. Some of you remember Charlie Bright. He was editor of the Shawnee News, not the News Star, but the Shawnee News Herald. And the Herald for several years here. Also, he was uh, representative of the legislature for the county. And he was the general of the state militia later on. Monday, Monday was the second county attorney of the county. The first one, James Woods, appointed by the Republicans, Monday was elected. He was a fine family, they were fine family of people. And uh, then there was Bob Wood. A man by the name of Springfield. And by the way, Springfield used to go to church in those days. And he was the object of considerable ridicule among some of the lawyers. At that time, we had a lot of saloons in Bottle Water County, and a big lot of business came from those saloons. And there wasn't too much. Uh, I didn't think civil business because the titles of the land hadn't been obtained at that time except in the towns. And they just seemed to think he was making a show. I don't think he was. I think he was a pretty fine fellow. And uh, Riceman, the other man was here. He was a member of the legislature from here. I didn't get acquainted with him. And there's an old fellow by the name of Chase. I don't mention him the other day. I thought his name was Case, but I guess it was Chase. But I'd read in history about some historic people named Chase. I was interested in the old fellow. He was tall. But he, had, uh, he was just destitute. I was told that it was largely due to his drinking. He's walked around town and uh, shoes, soles off, nearly off. I saw him in court once or twice, and he deported himself as a lawyer, a good lawyer, and I just wondered if which kid got him or what it was. And let's see, there was uh, Brothers, he was the <coughs> county, county judge under the populace, a man by the name of Porter, a fine old lawyer that I didn't know very much about, he didn't stay very long. Nightfall, Madden. Madden was a tall, genteel, nice looking fellow that uh, practiced in the early courts. I heard him arguing a case one time over paying a teacher a school uh, salary after the schoolhouse had been burned down, down, down the local. And uh, Judge Pendleton was county judge, and the case was in that. It was on the school teacher's salary was in his jurisdiction. And he made a fine speech. And old Judge Pendleton went into a hutter and Put it on his chin there for a while. Finally, he came across with a decision that it was an act of God, technically speaking. And the school board <coughs> couldn't replace the schoolhouse, and they couldn't pay the teacher the salary for the rest of the year. The case stood up. Was good law or not? I don't know. It's up now. Sounds to me like good law at the time. <coughs> then there was uh, Judge Pittman. You know, he's one of the first lawyers I heard plead a case. He was pleading a case, and uh, Randall told you about it the other day. I went into the courtroom, and the Christian boys, I think it was, had just been convicted, or, or just about to be convicted. They were uh, making their pleas. And there was some question about uh, where the uh, actual killing took place, and where some of the witnesses were that testified, and about a hill, a certain little hill. And there was considerable testimony that these witnesses that claimed they saw the fight were, looking, were on the other side of the hill and couldn't possibly see it. And the only thing I heard Judge Crickman say, and I think it's the first thing he said, he says, we want to talk a little bit about these fellows that looked through that hill and saw that murder. I'd have probably forgot all about it if he hadn't said, look through that hill and saw that murder. And, and that's the murder. Okay. Then we had Holt. He was one of the second fellows that came in. He was county attorney here one time. And he's the first fellow I ever heard to get out on the street and call the judge crooked. And I, I was on his side of the case. Sympathetically, I don't know whether he was right or not, but I know the judge wasn't crooked. I know he was a good honest judge. Uh, well, not his time. I'm not arguing about his religion now. I'm talking about the system. <laughs> <laughs> I know that judge. I tried to get many cases for him, and I know that he was, uh, he was not crooked. I had a case, that's Charlie Wilson. I had, had a case before him one time. A couple of old boys out southwest of Tecumseh was on a piece of mortgage land. And uh, Judge said, cut them, brought a suit, foreclosed that mortgage, made those boys parties, and uh, made them <coughs> defendants, and they didn't have sense enough to go get a lawyer to look out for them, of course. They didn't think it made any difference. They were just winners. But he got a judgment to remove them from the place and take their crop. 
Didn't bother him for about six months, and at the end of six months, they got out of execution to chase him off. At that time, they had a perfectly good crop, a nice crop. They'd done well. Well, they come walking into my office there one afternoon, told me what he was doing. Well, I said, I don't know whether I can do anything for you or not. You wait a long time. We'll just try it. And if I don't do anything for you, you don't pay me. And if I do, you give me $10. So I went over across the street, found a motion, and the judge came down a couple of days later. Dad got up there and he introduced all of his papers, including the execution and everything. The old judge just quieted himself from I said, oh, I saw I wasn't necessary. It's going to be between him and the judge unless I had to say the better it be expect. He didn't do a thing, but old 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 Thad, old Thad's one of his best friends. He just looked up at him and boiled. He ruled that the board could pay the, that the board could take the crop and pay their, their rate just like it agreed to. I went out the door and Harrington and Oscar was listening to me. He said, "Now, nice, judge, don't you see what a good judge can do?" <laughs> Those little things I remember. They were part of my education. I learned practice law. Well, let me see. Now then, we have uh, after Pittman. Then we came the Riley. They came in in the second bunch. Riley and Joe Adams, fellows. They were seldom as kind of responsible for them. They were good friends for a long time. They fell out later on. It's too bad about that, but they fell out. But they were good friends at that time. And uh, then there was uh, Joe Adams and Abernathy. You've probably heard of the Abernathy's. The uh, young, first time I remember seeing young George, he was our age, he in the county court before uh, Judge Maven. Judge Maven was county judge this poor statehood. <coughs> I didn't know what the case was, but I was interested in it, and I liked Abernathy's looks. And I went out and told somebody, I asked young fellow if he going to make a place for himself in the law practice in Pottawatomie County. I told them about that several years later. He and I had some were fairly lawsuits against each other before the thing was over. But I told him about that, and I told him I never changed my mind. Well, I sometimes had a little different feeling towards him than I had right then, but uh, we wound up with friends, you know, for 10 years, he, really. He was uh, a member of my Sunday school class when I was teaching the senior Sunday school class in, in, uh, in uh, the Presbyterian Church. There he is, and that's his class at that time. That's a few years before he got sick and died. That's a fine-looking bunch of folks. Only about two of us left at this time living. That's what time does to you. And uh, then let's leave. Abernathy, Howell. Howell. Well, of course, all of you know about who Howell was. I knew him pretty well. One time while I was visiting the county attorney, I had a case to get the fellow for uh, stealing copper out for an engine down here or something like that. And I filed a case against him and didn't let to try it. And he pled guilty. And we sued him to penitentiary for a couple of years. Two days after that, he had called me. He was kept attorney for the railroad at that time. I guess they were a little afraid of me. I expect they put a well away of ours. I probably didn't do, know too much law. They were afraid that I wouldn't get it done pretty good, you know. So how I called up to ask me something about it. And I answered his question. He says, when's the case coming up? Well, I says, Ed, the case has been disposed of. It's let Gary go to penitentiary for a couple of years. Huh. You knocked me out of two hundred dollars salary. So let me see. I wonder if I was a little bit. Oh yeah. Now the fellow from Texas. I can't remember his name. I wish I could remember. He was the county attorney here, and I could tell some good stories. And then Max Freeman. Freeman was the most eloquent man I expect to deliver on the bar here in Baltimore the County. He was a real orator. He was a graduate of Harvard College, Harvard University. He talked to me one day. He says, Clarence, you ought to go to Harvard just for the spread of the thing. I says, Mr. Freeman, there's just two big reasons why I can't go for go to Harvard. One of them is I haven't got any money. Don't make it unbid a business about the other one. <laughs> but he could tell me things about it. I know. I watched his career. You know one of the peculiar things. I don't know how many of the early lawyers here were graduates of, of uh, law schools. There were no law schools in Oklahoma at the time I went to went to Tecumseh in, in 1894. They were just 
<laughs> University over at uh, Norman, of course, and uh, they got their legal training before they came here. I made a little research about that. I got a hold of uh, an Oklahoma history published oh, about 35 years ago that gave the names of several of those fellow lawyers, but it didn't mention any law school. And I have an idea properly that uh, they never attended the law school. Then I got a bit of curiosity, too. I got to wonder how many of the old timers way back there just after the United States became a government. What kind of legal training they had? And uh, I have a book about the uh, law associations of the bar associations of the United States. And I looked over and hunted up that bunch. And uh, that great law teacher of uh, Harvard that wrote there for several years, he had a list of it. Seven of the early lawyers that were very, very prominent and influential in the United States. And he said only five of them were graduates of colleges. Not, even, not law schools, but colleges. And he didn't name our first great uh, uh, teacher of uh, Harvard that wrote there for several years, he had a list of seven of the early lawyers that were very, very prominent and influential in the United States, and he said only five of them were graduates of colleges, not, even, not law schools, but colleges, and he didn't name our first great uh, uh, <coughs> chief justice of the United States that served 35 years, and I looked up to see what he knew about law. And I found out that he only had one year of law school. He never graduated from college. But he's one of the most brilliant lawyers in the United States. I mean, he's one of the greatest. Uh, what? He made more law in determining matters about the Constitution. Well, let me see. Now, some of the out of town lawyers that I saw in that time. Charlie West came down here one time as the attorney general to prosecute a bunch of the boys that got mixed up with the bootlegging business just after statehood. I was county superintendent of schools, and I had been pretty well appointed in the county. I had made a campaign or two, and I taught school in the county, and I knew all the members of the school boards, and we had farmer jurors in that time. And he came up, he or somebody in his office came in there and asked me about some of the jurors. They wanted to know something about them. He was one of them, I could tell him that they might question him. That was a good old fellow that I knew that, that killed a man, then tried and quit it, but he still killed a man, so they knocked him off the years down. I got a thing with Charlie West. Norman Pruitt was down here arguing suit cases. I never got a thing with him, but I listened to him. He was at his peak that time, and of course you know how he died. He was finally in a home up there. And it seemed like it to me that those fellows had made a practice criminal law sometimes had to associate too much with those fellows they represented and uh, something whiskey or something got a good many of them. Then Blakeney represented a fellow in the south part of the county one time with a charge of murder. He acquitted, got him acquitted. And the old fellow invited him down to the south part of the county right down in the bottoms there and spent all night with him. Then came back and Telling somebody you're not going down there anymore. The old man fine guest and treated him fine, but he says all night long he was sleeping upstairs. All night long he could see and hear fellows coming out of the dark and coming around that old man's house and talking to him. And he got uneasy as all get out. You know, that was the days when they had the uh, horse thief lines from Texas to Missouri and back. And they had their stations along in the bottoms and places like that. Man, just got scared. I heard a lot of stories about some of these old timers, and maybe if I have time, I'll come to that in a minute. I think my time is brought up. And uh, <laughs> let's see some of the other lawyers here. That was H.H. H. Smith, Howland Harry, they used to call him. Well, the real partnership when I first started, I went into his office in a big, big, fine library, and he wanted me to take over the library and pay for it. He owed about $600 on it. And he was going 
Only all the small cases come there. All the little cases are there. It looks like a pretty good problem, doesn't it? Well, there's nothing there, Gigi, like you came in. What else? He said, you see that? He said, I had an expert on the stand. He said, you've got to pay those fellows if they testify. Just immediately after that, Hale man came in, dropped him the letter, and opened the letter, and handed it over to me to look at it. He said, you see that? He had an overdraft in the bank for $150. Well, I decided I just didn't want that partnership anyhow. But he was a great, he was a great lawyer. And, uh, and I don't know just exactly what happened to him. I heard a lot of stories about it, but it don't make any difference. <laughs> and the lawyer he was a partner, too. I think he was just sort of a little while. Went out west and got rich. He came to see me about 15 years ago. Well, let me see. There's a lot of other lawyers that I just uh, can't remember too well the old times. You know, the other day, I uh, went down here to, uh, I went over there and looked at, at the company of Buddington. We've got the old files back to 1894. And in those days, the lawyers advertised in the list of them that long. Now, I couldn't find the old three newspapers that were there that, the uh, Herald is one of the first ones, and the, uh, the uh, Populist Bureau, I forget what they call that one, but uh, that one had a mouse, he had to that. He was, he was smart. They were all smart. They were just smart as they could be. But uh, they had a little feud going on one of all the time. I found out after that, that feud is just a complete person selling papers. Personally, they were good friends. And, uh, but in that list of lawyers, I was interested to see those full of names that were, that were uh, advertising. And they'd advertise, and uh, sometimes they'd tell that they were Supreme Court, uh, uh, I mean, didn't have, had a law degree, and sometimes they wouldn't. Most of the times they didn't. But I noticed today, those days, the fellows that I didn't think had law courses had the biggest business for some reason or another. They would get those old boys out on the west that just sat in there and both hammer and tongs and won their cases. Now, in that list of advertising, I saw them, I saw them, oh, I don't know, I just don't know. I won't talk a minute or two about the lawyer that I've been most associated with. There's, there's hundreds of them that came and went. During the, during the oil boom, uh, a lot of new lawyers came. You know, that was a funny thing. We had about 14,000 people before the oil boom. A lot of them sold out to newcomers and other people came in. And uh, along about 1929, we had 63,000 people in Pottawatomie County. And there was a case transferred from, from uh, somewhere else over here to be tried. It was a case against uh, an oil company. And uh, the lawyers that came in here were not very well acquainted. And they asked the court clerk to recommend somebody to help them select the jury. Well, one side got Judge George, George Elvin had it, and the other side got me. We went over there to help them, help them select the jury. And the first 12 men, they got on that jury, I've never heard tell of either one of us. <laughs> one, two. Please conclude the remarks of Judge Clarence Robinson in front of the Pottawatomie County Bar Association in Shawnee, Oklahoma. In uh, November of 19... Seminole County and found a 
Well, he went with my old friend, and he didn't have sense enough to go down there and, and contest it, and she got a judgment against him for half his land. He had 80 acres and a thousand dollars judgment against the other half. Well, about that time, he woke up. He came up to see me, and I went down there and found out she already married the other fellow going to Arkansas and hadn't waited for six months anyway. I filed a motion to set aside because they didn't have jurisdiction from their residence. And the old judge down there, the judge Ashley, I forgot his name right now, but uh, he uh, just set aside, that's all was to it, and not left her hanging on a limb. She didn't, she was married to a fellow living with him that wasn't her husband. So uh, I filed a case for my man up here in Potawatomi the County for a divorce. And then the guy came up and heard her devil at me. He went over there and I alleged in my petition <coughs> the facts that I just stated and that marriage has been set aside. And Judge got up and just bounced and went and stated that that wasn't so. Made me a little mad. I liked old Judge a little right, but I didn't care particularly about being called a liar right in open court. And then I got to thinking, now, Judge, I can he wouldn't have said that if he hadn't had some good cause for it. So I held my temper a little bit. Asked for a couple of weeks' time. I went down to Weewooka to see what the heck had happened down there. And there was a feud down there between that judge and the lady court clerk. And when I took that thing down to her, she stuck it in the pigeonhole and didn't file it. But it was signed all right, and I failed to get a certified copy of it. So I got it filed, got a couple of certified copies, and one of them stuck one of them under the judge's nobles, and I says, read that, Mr. Abernathy. Well, he is went out on them too then. He had a client that was living with another man that wasn't divorced. So I didn't have much trouble getting a divorce. I gave the, I got 20 acres of royalty for my uh, fee, and the old man got his land back. I gave the judge and his client 10 acres left. I sold five acres for $1,500, and I still got the other five. It's got a dry hole, and then you boys want it for two minutes an acre, you can buy it. I don't know what judge you are, you know. The judge and I were, we had another case one time that was a little different than that. Well, he was a driver, lady, I come see, and the action comes out. And uh, one nice old lady over there, she comes see, got off the car there, and just as she started to get out, the dog gone thing jiggled a little, and she broke her ankle. And she was pretty sick for a while, and she came up to me, and I wrote him a couple of letters, and got the usual bush off, and paying attention to me. So I found a case. It came up for trial, and... Well, the judge was looking to do that one smoke for me. I take a course in applied psychology on the old Dr. Mother up at Edmund, but I couldn't figure his face out. So I don't know see Mr. Mr. Mark Gould. I'd had some experience with Mark. I liked old Mark in spite of just pushing me around here once in a while. I says, Mark, I've got a case over here. It's a good case. But I says, there's something a little wrong with it. I know the old I've had a look. I want to come over and look it over and I'll give you a third of the fee if I get him. I had a contingent fee. So he came over and looked at the set of clients, and he was sure he had made a mistake here in the service. And the Supreme Court's mean about that. He said, get permission to correct it. And I asked old Judge to fix my permission to get that corrected. And I got back up there, and the smile was all going off the of his face. So I got back up there. He went out in the hall and sold it. He gave me $3,000. I got uh, a third of that as contingent fee, and I gave old Mark a third of it. He kind of bought and said he. Clarence, I didn't do anything. I said, the heck you didn't. You saved me from losing the case. So he took it. He didn't have to twist his arm too hard. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Good and I had a lot of fun together, too. Now, he was just a little bit rough on young lawyers and beginners. He started out to win his cases. That was his business. You know, I heard the criticism of him. I was a young lawyer one time, he just got started in and got here two or three years. I was up in the old courthouse, John Stoddard, near the toilet there, and I heard a couple of farmers talking. One of them says, that lawyer says, they make a lot of fun about him, he hasn't got any sense. The other says, I know he has. The other says, I've been he wins his cases. That's part of my education. If you want to practice law, you've got to win your cases. Too. Ed Reacher said his law dean in Texas told him when he was graduating down there, he says, there's two things you've got to do. Take care of your office and the office will take care of you if you've got any sense. And the other thing, you've got to win some cases. Well, old uh, Judge Good and I 
just after I was about a deputy county attorney, he was only about two years after I was getting to practice law and hadn't practiced very much yet. He uh, got a friend, this my uh, chief, he was the county attorney. He brought a case against a fellow out here in northeast of town somewhere for hooking his wife. They were Indians. And when I, he sent me over to try the case. I didn't know anything about it. I'd never seen it, but then it was just a plain old case of a thousand bad head on his wife. And right away he started the case, and old Bob come in, running into a house, and I come in the other, and he began to yell as soon as he got in there and make a big lot of fuss. He's going to bust me out. I reckon I know what he's trying to do. He came in there, and he kept a talking. Old Judge, the fine old Judge, he's a colonel in the Confederate Army, and Lee's Army wasn't afraid of anything. Had a very bald head, worse than I was, bad kind of victim of the terrorist. He just looked like a skating rink for flies, and that's what he said. That's what he was doing that time. He got the night travel with his capital, and he was a fighting the flies. And I filed all the cases in his court, and I was a deputy county attorney, and I filed cases there too. So he was caught for the two men, dead in the deep blue sea. And he let my cow, and I let the cow one too, and we had to have a howling match, and he was a fighting fire. <laughs> and uh, finally, I said, Mark, let's go out in the hall. And I wanted to look at me kind of funny. He was about half as big again as I was. He walked out and says, Clarence, this isn't anything to fight about. And I said, Good Lord, Mark, if I thought you'd fight me, I wouldn't go out here. And I said, Well, I don't want to know this. What you're howling about? I said, I'm going to try if you've done any lawsuit and get rid of it. Well, he said he was just fired to help Fort Wright get a, get a good divorce settlement. This one was suing for divorce. Well, I said, I never heard of that. Divorce case, I wouldn't help talk anyhow. He did his best to keep me from getting this job. I don't know him anything politically. I liked him pretty well, but I didn't know him anything politically. And I said, let's go back in there and you quit calling me. Tell me that and I'll quit calling you a darn liar. And so we went back in and tried to get his Yes, of course, we got a conviction. It was an uh, appeal to the county court, Hal Johnson was county judge. And when they brought the Indian in there for, uh, by the way, Mark told me that the woman was a sister of Jim Fox. He said she's an athlete. And she could uh, cook that color anytime she wanted to. Well, I said she's pregnant. She couldn't now. She's not in that condition. Anyhow, I said we we're going to try this case. So Hal said when they brought the Indian in there, and he read the complaint to him, asked him to give you not give him. The old Indian said, oh. He said, you're charged there with whipping your wife. Did you whip her or not? He said, sure, she's my wife. The last uh, very important case we had, I just, uh, I, didn't get rich, but I picked up a little money along with me. And uh, so I got to be a stockholder in the bank. Attorney for the bank and attorney for another bank. So 1929, the whole darn outfit went broke and I went busted too. But before that, the uh, market filed a case against the bank for they'd uh, taken a deed from a fellow from whom they had a lot of notes and mortgages and things. And he was going to set aside on on the theory that they taken it uh, just to get uh, to hold his trustee for it so they could sell it and they get their money back. But uh, my banker claimed that it was an absolute sale. And that's the question. Well, he beat me in the, in the district court. What did the judge buy? I mean, there's oh, another judge who he got in there. No, he's kind of young. He didn't. Uh, and uh, I appealed it to the Supreme Court. Meantime, the bank had gone into the hands of the United States receiver. They beat me on the first round. The Supreme Court farmed it off as one of these wonderful fellows outside the lot of the value of opinion and bring it back, and they decided against me. I filed a motion for uh, new hearing, like, and got the case reversed on new hearing. Then I had trouble with the United States about a fee. And John Good was a very nice fellow. He came across and wrote me a nice letter backing me up, and so I got a thousand dollar fee out of that. And it was a good thing I did because they had me charged with a thousand dollars double liability and about a thousand dollars other stuff that I brought from the varieties and things to keep getting in trouble with the government. So 
that she was going to marry the skids on her house and moved off from St. Leon. She didn't. I sued the old man for $400 for what the house was worth in the world. I don't know. And I got a judgment for $200. Something like that. Pretty good judgment, but in the meantime, I'm destroying the case. Well, she was fat stuff. She told me some things to ask him. And, uh, I asked him, he got pretty doggone mad about that, jumped up the third rate, beat some fellow, he was six feet, and some fellow was beat, pulled out his pocket knife, and come get me. I didn't think he was going to do it, I was just looking, I just looked at him, and old Judge Pittman called him down pretty hard. Well, the jury went out and brought in a buddy, I'm trying to find a lot of ways. And finally, the jury come by and says, Clarence, you've got somebody going to start down there, he's going to get him. I some pretty good friends on the jury. I don't hurt your lawsuits at that time. So, but about six months after that, they start building a well down that coast of about 160 acres of land on the northwest corner of it. And, uh, a lot of those folks, you know, that found out around, they went to building shops all around the corner there. And the oil company went into Hal Johnson's court over there, the district court, to get a injunction to put those folks on there. They prayed they're not to the fire and burn out. Well, one of the richest men down now came and hired me to go over there and defend that case for them. I didn't you know why he did it. I didn't understand. He didn't care. You know, ask too many questions when you're getting legitimate business in there. So I went over there, put on the evidence, run the lawsuit, went back to my office, and figured he'd go there to pay me directly. And just about 24 hours later, he said, I got to have a chair. Come this week, we go with some of the gun and dodge suit. He was going to cut my throat. He come a-walking out of the office. 